Testing. Testing. There we go. How are we doing, family? Are we doing okay? Are we blessed? Happy to be here? Uh, before we start, I just want to say uh, I'm so blessed and happy to be a part of El Cajon. Um, I'm excited to work with the youth. Where are my youth in collegiate at? Everybody? Someone? There you go. Over there on the left side. Some on the right. Family, at this time, we're going to have <clears throat> worship. And uh, if you can just sing along, How Great Is Our God. As we sing the song, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his
Okay, those of you able to kneel, please do so. If you want to stand in the presence of God and pour your heart out, you're welcome to do that too. Um, or remain sitting. God, God can hear us no matter where our bodies are. <clears throat> Let's up, bow our heads. Father God, thank you for Sabbath. Um, we're all here. We, we made it through this week, and we praise your name for that. Um, some of us have different challenges. Some of us had a good week. Some of us did not have a good week. But um, regardless, we're here. We are here in your house of worship to, um, to worship you. And um, Everett, we're talking to Jesus right now. Please be still. Go to Miss, go to Miss Vicky. <clears throat> Lord, um, we praise your name and we will magnify your name and your character because you are holy. Um, and you are powerful, and you are worthy of all praise. And so here we are to praise you. And even when we don't feel that things are going well, we want to praise you. Um, like Job said, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. And we want to, to tell you that this morning, that no matter what happens, no matter what happens, we will trust you. And we know that your spirit will make that statement true. We want you to be in us, dwelling in us, um, living through us. As we naturally, we are selfish, we are, we are, we are whiners, we are critical. We, there's so many things, Father, that, that we are and you know. You know us. You know us better than we know ourselves. So please search our hearts right now and convict us of the sin that so easily ensnares us. It, it just keeps tearing us and, and bringing us and dragging us down. Um, Lord, convict us of that and free us from that today. Um, Lord, the, the sin that we aren't aware of, that we're kind of blind to, please open our eyes so that we can surrender it to you as well, and that you can live through us every moment of every day, that others can see you in us and not our sinful selves. Father, free us from sin. May we completely focus on you. And we need your passion. We desperately need your vision, especially in these last days. You are coming soon. Our, our, the name of our church on the front door, that's what it says. Seventh-day Adventists. We come and gather and worship you on the seventh-day Sabbath, and we also are looking forward to your soon return. And, and God, um, some of us are not living like we really believe it, myself included. And, and I, we need that to change. We desperately need that to change. So please change that in us. Lord, we thank you so much for how you have been moving in our community and in our lives and in our church with the um, Arabic-speaking community. I praise your name for that. For a vacation Bible school coming up, I praise your name for that. I thank you for all the children and their parents that are going to, to find out about it. Um, Lord, please pester us until we ask those neighbors that we haven't talked to, but we see they have kids. Um, Lord, I know my neighborhood is full of them. Lord, help me to, to find the time, to make the time, to seize the opportunities that are right there. You have so many opportunities in front of us, and, and sometimes we're just focused on our plans, and we miss them. Well, we don't want to miss them anymore. We want more God moments. Um, thank you for Steve's um, night of rest last night. That is amazing. We thank you so much for that. And... Uh, Lord, all the other matters in our church, um, some of the problems would just melt away if, if our hearts are right with you. So we invite you in, in, our, in our house of worship, in your house of worship, and in our hearts. Um, use us as you want. Lay on our hearts how you want us to pray, because you have the power. You're just waiting to unleash it if we would just but ask. 
So please use us the way you want to. Work through us. Finish the work. Send more laborers into your field. We thank you for Luke Rios, and um, we just praise you for the work you're going to be doing through him and, and through our youth. And um, Father, we just invite you. Please use your church as you would. In your precious name, amen. For the glory and honor of God, we have this song. Amen. Today's scripture reading will be from the back of your bulletins, number 715. And as I read the light te text, please join in with me for the bold. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the council of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his words giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever, holy and awesome in his name. The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom all who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Amen.
जाग कार के ना खाओ There is no sorrow too deep He cannot soothe introduced uh, me. My name again, my name is Jonathan Park. I was made in Korea and got imported to U.S. when I was 10 years old. And God have given me impression when I was young kid to be a pastor. And I thank God for that privilege. There was this man, this old retired person who had great, great memories with his wife for 40 plus years. And unfortunately, he lost his wife. He lived alone for a while and realized that he needs to check into a better facility where there will be other senior citizens for him to make friends and just something outside of his own house. So he sold his house, moved into a retirement home, he was worried at time because he wasn't sure if he was going to make any friends. He didn't know anybody in that facility. But eventually, he spent some time and got to know people and eventually also met a lovely lady. And they had a chemistry, so they spent lots of time together, and he decided to propose to her, which he did. He came home, had a good night's sleep like Steve, had wonderful, wonderful uh, sleep, maybe too good of sleep, that when he got up, he remembered proposing to her. He just couldn't remember whether she said yes or no. That happens, I guess. So with great embarrassment, he, he, he went to her, her side of apartment, knocked on the door, and he was a little sheepish, a little embarrassed. So he put his head down and says, Honey, you know I love you. I remember proposing to you last night. For the life of me, I can't remember whether you said yes or no. Sorry, but can you repeat one more time? And he kind of he looked up, and she, she had, there was a, this big beam on her head, and, and on her mouth, smile, and she goes, oh, that's so, I'm so glad. I woke up this morning, I remember saying yes, I just couldn't remember who proposed to me. They're a good fit for one another. <laughs> there are certain things in our lives that we just should not forget. Your spouse's birthdays, anniversaries. But when it comes to Christian life, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, there are two things that are so basic. We live with it for years, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, that sometimes we forget why. We're Christians. Sometimes we forget who this God is. There is no greater joy when, when you sense that your life is under the control of God because you know you've just been used by God. Close from this location, you have SeaWorld, and I used to take my kids to SeaWorld. 
And there, somewhere, I, it's been a long time since I went to SeaWorld, but I remember there was a little pond that kids get, get to put their hands in the water, try to either grab fish or touch uh, those starfish and whatnot. And I saw this fish that was gliding in. I was like, oh, that's a little shark. Everybody took their hands off. But somebody there said something that was very interesting. And I don't know if it's that particular type of shark, but he said, that shark grows in proportion to the aquarium that he lives. So that was eight inch shark. And as long as that shark live in that pond, that is the maximum length that you will grow to, eight inch. But you pick up that same shark and throw it out in the Pacific Ocean, you will grow to eight feet shark. Isn't that amazing? So my question to you is, are you a cute Seventh-day Adventist Christian that loves to live in your own pond of safety, comfort? You're cute, but that's about it. Or are you an eight-feet shark where your Christianity, your Adventism extends beyond these walls, extend beyond your homes, extend beyond your families and close-knit friends. Well, yes, there are rejections. Yes, there's uncertainties. In fact, some people may just downright be against Adventism or Christianity, and yet, are you willing that your Christianity, your faith, goes beyond these walls. If that is the case, God will help you to become eight feet Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And that's what every one of us want to experience. In fact, when you read Scripture, especially in the in book, um, book of Joshua, what happens in Joshua, if you have a Bible, please open up to Joshua chapter 14. The background of the story is that Israelites came out of Egypt. They soon came right in front of Canaan, sent 12 spies. They all came back. You know this story, right? People were excited. Wow, look at those grapes. Wow, they have honeys and milk. And wow, that, this is a place that God has promised us. They were excited until the bad news came where 10 spies said, however, but those people, they are fierce. They are giants. There's no way we could win them in battles. And because majority said it is impossible, people sided with them. And as you know, they wandered the wilderness for 40 years. They came back with new generation, except Joshua and Caleb. And this time, instead of relying on majority, they only sent two, just to check things out. Come, came back, same giants lived. But this time, instead of fixing their eyes on the giants, they fixed their eyes on God. So they marched forward. They battled for five years. And thus we come to Joshua chapter 14. Here is, jo uh, here is Caleb in front of Joshua stating, this is verse, verse 10, Now then, just as the Lord promised me, he has kept me alive for 45 years. Since the time he said this to Moses, while Israelites moved about in the desert, so here I am today. 85 years old, I am still as strong today as the Lord, as the Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to the battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me on that day. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there, those are the giants. Their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he we all want to be used by God. We want our prayers to be answered by God. And we, it feels great. However, are there times where we give our excuses, which prevents us to be used by God, which prevents us to become eight-feet sharks? 
Verse 10, he says, Now then, just as the Lord promised me, he has kept me alive for 45 years. And how old is he at this time? 80. Wow. 85 years old. Any of you 85 here? Over? <laughs> okay, there's few. Great. I love Asian culture because we respect those who ages. But here is Caleb, 85. He could have just said, I am too old. Let the young people do th their thing. Isn't that what we always encourage? Young people, young people? I don't deny that. In fact, I encourage it. Problem is, those who are older say, well, let the young people do it. Somebody was young, and we don't do anything. Perhaps it's the age. Perhaps it's your health. Perhaps it's your, it's, it's your education. When pastor comes to you or anybody comes up to you and says, can you lead out in Sabbath school lesson? What do we say? Um, pastor, I'm not equipped enough. I don't know Bible enough. In fact, in fact, there are times where we look at ourselves and we go, God or pastor or superintendent, whoever it is, you know, if I know Bible this much, then I will lead out. When, when I have, I don't have much time, but if I, have, if I have a lot more time, then I will do something. I don't have much money. When I become rich, then I will contribute. In fact, you could even say, God, my English isn't good enough. When, my, when I am fluent in English, then I will do your work. <clears throat> in fact, there's a great illustration on this. There was a, this Korean grandmother who came to the came to United States, to North Carolina, where her daughter lived. Uh, she came over when she was about 70-ish. She came to North, uh, North Carolina to live there. At first, it was great. But she soon realized that closest Korean church from her house was an hour away. She does not live in Korean community. Everybody is Anglo. Everybody is white in, her, in that side of country, I guess. And she realized that, what am I doing here? I enjoy my daughter. I enjoy spending time with my granddaughter, uh, grandkids. But beside Friday night and Sabbath, I have no community. I can't even speak English other than, hello, my name is. How are you? God, what am I doing here? So she started praying. She started praying. She started praying, God, I want to do something for you, but what can I do? I can't even communicate with my neighbors. And then she was inspired. She called her pastor and said, Pastor, can you give me a Bible study pamphlet in English? Pastor didn't know why she wanted Bible study in English language, but he got it. He got, uh, he brought it to her, and there she was. Uh, on Sabbath afternoon, she went to her neighbor, knocked on the door, Mrs. Smith came out. Oh, hi, Mrs. Kim. All the Koreans have last name of either Lee, Kims, or Parks so about it. <clears throat> hi, Mrs. Kim, how are you doing? Oh, me, me no English. Uh, you, me, good? It's amazing how Americans understand broken English. Oh, you want me to read this pamphlet so that you can learn English? Come on in. She came in. There's coffee table. There's, they put out a little tea. And Mrs., uh, Mrs. Smith took out the pamphlet and says, OK, are you ready, Mrs. Kim? And Mrs. Kim had no idea what she's saying, but through body language, she thought, yes. Creation, number one, in the beginning. I don't know why we think that just because we speak English really slow, the person who doesn't speak English all of a sudden understands English. But anyway, in the beginning, and this grandma had no idea what she's saying, but she just smiled and said, uh-huh, yes, amen. They went through that for 45 minutes. <clears throat> she went home. Next Sabbath, Sabbath afternoon, knocked on the door. Hi, Miss, uh, hi, Mrs. Kim, come on over, lesson two. The following Sabbath afternoon, lesson three, lesson four, lesson five, 
they went on and on and on and on, and finally, less than maybe 14 or so, Mrs. Smith said, Mrs. Kim, I would like to go to your church. You say amen, but Mrs. Kim was stressed. My church is one hour away, and the whole program is in English. What am I going to do? So she called the pastor, and Korean, this Korean pastor said, Oh, you know, there are 10 minutes from your house. There's a, a Seventh-day Adventist uh, Caucasian church. Why don't you take her there? So they arranged it, and there she went. She entered into the worship room with Mrs. Smith. They sat in the pulpit for a whole two and a half hours. She had no, Mrs. Kim had no idea what the worship service was about, but she sat patiently for the sake of Mrs. Smith. Let's, fo- let's fast forward four years. This particular church hosted a banquet in honor of Mrs. Kim. Do you know why? In the span of four years, she led 24 souls to that church. And far as I know, to this day, she still doesn't speak English. <laughs> she could have easily said, God, I don't know this language. There is nothing I could do for you here. But let us remember, God never asked any of you to fill somebody else's cup. All God asked you is to, whatever you have, to empty your cup. It's simple as that. How simple can it get? Many times we try to fill somebody else's cup, and we feel like, there's no way. I just don't have enough money. I just don't have enough time. I just don't have this. I don't have that. We give all kinds of excuses and good reasons at times. But every single time that you come up with the reason why you cannot fill somebody else's lives, and God will say, you are absolutely right. You can't. Only thing that I ask from you is empty your cup. You want to ex- experience miracles? When you come into the sanctuary and degree of your spirituality, degree of your energy, degree of your experience will all differ. Maybe some of you only have 10%. Maybe some of you, it was a great week and you're 99% full of energy. Some, some, some of us and just put a mask of Adventists and just smile at the worship, but inside you're burning up. But if, you, if we all are busy emptying ourselves, next thing that happens is that we walk out with our cups full. And when you come out of the, 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 those doors, you're, we are ready to empty our cups to our neighbors. That's exactly what Caleb was at. He said, my age is not an issue. God, you promised me 45 years ago. I am going regardless of my age, regardless of my conditions. It's not just old age, by the way. John Huss, 30, Martin Luther, 22, John Calvin, 24, John Wesley, 26, Ellen G. White, 17. Regardless of age, God says, I could use you. Just say, here I am, Lord. Send me. The rest, God will take care of it. All you have to do is empty your cup. Second point is that you need to vigorously work toward your dream. Verse 11, I am still as strong today as the Lord sent me out. I'm, I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. He was ready to go out. He didn't say, God, you promised, therefore make it happen. He said, God, you promised, so I am going to journey with you. Whenever we journey as a Christian, believe me, there will be giants. I don't know what your giants are. Maybe it's your finance your health, your relationship with your spouse, your parents, your siblings, your, your, your children, or even with God. Or perhaps there's a conflict within this church. Perhaps this, perhaps that. We all have giants as we try to be Christians. Caleb definitely faced giants. They, were, they existed 45 years ago. They still exist 45 years later for Caleb. 
But instead of fixing his eyes on the giants, he decided to fix his eyes on Jesus Christ. When you live your Christian lives, you will face giants, giants of opposition, giants of failure, giants of discouragement. But instead of focusing your eyes on those giants, focus on eyes of discouragement, focus on eyes, excuse me, focus on eyes on, on God who encourages you, God who loves you, God who will be with you. In fact, in Tennessee, there was this lady by name Karen. Wow, is that the right time? You know, when I was pastoring a Korean church, Holy Spirit stops at 12 o'clock. <laughs> Sermon stops at 12 o'clock, and, and then I came into conference. I'm preaching at different churches, and when, when I go to black churches, I realized that then I knew that Holy Spirit goes to Korean church until 12 o'clock, and then he hops over to black church because I don't go off to preach until like 1 o'clock. <laughs> so, so I don't know what time we end, <laughs> but uh, I'll try to cut it short. <laughs> There was this lady uh, by name Karen. She was pregnant. She had a three-year-old boy uh, named by Michael. And Michael was so excited that she's, he's going to have a little baby girl. So there was this ritual every evening that after mommy reads a uh, bedtime story to Michael, Michael in turn will ask mom to lie down and would rephrase, retell the story to his little unborn ba uh, baby sister. And after that, he would sing a song. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine, you make, and so on. He would sing maybe once, maybe twice, sometimes even three times, and then he, he would go to sleep. That happened day after day after day. Toward the, toward the end, uh, a little later, uh, toward the end of you know, time when she was about due, she felt this pain on her back, uh, on her stomach, maybe like uh, two months before, and, and, and she was, she went to hospital. That hospital said, our hospital is too small. You need to go over to Nashville. So she was rushed to Nashville uh, Hospital, the largest hospital. She was rushed into sur uh, surgery, and they had a C-section, took the baby out. Mother was okay, but baby wasn't. The doctor came to Karen and says, ma'am, we're doing our best, but it doesn't look good. A day went by, three days went by, a week went by. Doctor came back and says, ma'am, we're doing everything that we can. There needs to be divine intervention. Another couple of days, two weeks. The whole time, Michael saying, mommy, mommy, I want to see my sister. Why can I not see my sister? Where is my sister? And as you know, a little boy cannot go into an ICU. Mom says, just wait, just wait, and just wait. Two weeks went by, doctors came to see her and says, ma'am, there's nothing you could do. It could be any moment. It could be any day. I think you should prepare. That's when Karen knew that if Michael doesn't see his little sister now, he will never be able to see her. So she, she dressed him up in oversized scrub, a scrub and grabs his hand and walks and marches into ICU. The head nurse looks at this little boy coming in with Karen, and the head nurse says, Ma'am, you cannot bring that little boy into ICU. And Karen says, Watch me. And just marched in. In front of this little incubator, Karen pulls a chair, lifts Michael on top of the chair, and to this Michael. To this little boy. Nothing matters. Doesn't matter there's this monitor with little beep, dying beep, infrequent beep. Doesn't matter if there was hoses running all over to, into that incubator. Nothing mattered. All he saw was, oh, my sister. My sister. And gave that big hug with a little arm of his. He had this huge smile. And he did what no one expected him to do. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy. And head nurse realized that there was a little peep. 
and the leather cape. So she said, Michael, keep singing, keep singing. Michael sang once, Michael sang twice, Michael sang three. Now doctors are rushing in. They had no idea what's going on other than that there was life in that monitor. In Woman's Magazine, they wrote an article on this. It was titled, The Miracle of a Brother's Song. And when they interviewed Karen, this is what Karen said, never give up on the people you love. Because soon after, that little baby was discharged. Doctors said there's no way we could explain this miracle, uh, medically. It was miracle of brother's song. You see, many times when we look at giants, we look at the giants or we look at ourselves. We compare ourselves with the giants as we're too tiny. There's no way we could win this war. Forgetting, forgetting that we are not the giant killers. God is the giant killer. We believe in that God. Don't ever forget that. And finally, in verse 12, I'll make it very short. Give me this hill country that the Lord promised me on that day. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will dra drive them out just as he said. You're never too young. You're never too old. God gives you promise. Go get them. But finally, third point is, God is with you. And that with, in Hebrew mind, gives this imagery that when we say somebody's with me, you're thinking somebody's right next to you. In Hebrew mind, they draw a picture of a God. When, when God, is with, God says God is with you, he's on the right-hand side, left-hand side, front, back, bottom, top, inside, out. So when God says God is with you, you are completely sur surrounded by God, 360 degrees, inside out. No wonder we should not be afraid of anything. In fact, I, I give lots of, uh, uh, I officiate many weddings, and I used to allow them to, husband and wife to be, to make up their own vows because it's creative, it's very personal. And I still allow them to do that, but I also ask them, you need to have this inside app, um, in your vow. And many of you have gone through it. To have and to hold, for better or for worse, for uh, richer or for poor, in sickness, in health, until death do us apart. The reason why I, I require the couple that I officiate in their marriage to put that in is because in Har uh, at Harvard University, this, this uh, chairperson of Harvard University, world-renowned author of many books, very, very influential man, realized that his wife had Alzheimer's disease. So he resigned to take care of his wife, took care of her five years. All these people came from Harvard University five years later and said, Sir, your, no, your wife no longer recognizes you at all as her husband. We will put her in the best facility that we have offered. You could visit any time you want. Can you please come back as a chairperson of religion department? Besides, you could make so much difference to young people today and leaders of tomorrow. It makes sense. But this is what he said to them. 45 years ago, I made promise before the congregation, before the pastor, before my wife, and before God. Rich or poor, in sickness or in health, until death do us apart, I will be faithful to her. Today, she doesn't recognize me as her husband, but I know she's my wife. Until death do us apart, I will be faithful to her. You know where he got that? Romans chapter 8. 
For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the kind of God that you worship. Yes, there are many struggles out there. You're going to have good days and bad days. In fact, your relationship with God will have high points and low points. But don't ever trust that feeling. Don't ever judge based on what you're experiencing. Base everything, not on yourself, not on giants before you, but based on this God who will never let you go. That is love transcends everything. And I pray that this El Cajon Church, with the leadership of pastor and elders and other leaders, together, you all become eight feet sharks. That because God is with you, because God will never let you go, walk out of this, uh, walk out of this sanctuary knowing that you've been empowered today, that God will empower you every day and make a difference in this community. May God bless you. Stand with us as we sing the marvelous grace. Father God, God, we come before you humbly. You have invited us to your sanctuary to hear your voice, to praise you, to empower us. Father, I pray that as we go out of this sanctuary into the world, 
that your glory be seen through us. Father, bless pastor, bless the leaders of this church, Amen. bless every one of congregation here. Amen. I ask that this El Cajon Seventh-day Adventist Church be beacon this, for this community. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.